All right, let's all stand. It's great to see you guys. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, we want to start with a word of prayer. Let's bow our heads. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful. Once again, you've given us life and uh, you've given us uh, movement and you gave us another opportunity to come and hang out with our friends and brothers and sisters in church and worship you and hear the word of the Lord once again. We thank you for the week that we just had. We thank you that you are with us uh, uh, when we were traveling. We thank you for the anointing that you had for us at Winterfest, the good time that we spent together. We thank you for everything you're doing in the world, Lord God. We come right now and we pray, Lord God, for uh, the country of Ukraine. We know that everything that's going on is under, under your control, Lord, and uh, we pray f especially for our brothers and sisters there, people that are running away, refugees, people that have to leave their houses, even young people, teenagers, just like uh, our young people, Lord God. I pray that you help them not to lose faith. We pray for the Holy Spirit to do uh, the work in everyone's heart and to uh, sustain your church and support it and protect it. Lord, we pray against any uh, plan of the enemy that it would be destroyed and only your will will be done, Lord God. And we thank you once again that we have peace here and we have the opportunity to come and worship you freely. And that's why we're here tonight to give you worship, to give you uh, glory and honor and to worship you we thank you for all the blessings in jesus mighty name and everyone said amen amen you guys ready to worship let's worship him tonight his word of our praise amen
taking time to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. After such a powerful week, I honestly couldn't wait for Friday to come. So we can just come, be in our element, and just worship the Lord. Um, I'm going to be a little bit longer tonight, no more than hopefully 10 minutes, if you guys want to have a seat, and then we'll pray. I think it's always interesting, I think Mikey says it, Raul says it, I say it, how our sermons and dems always align to what the other person is preaching or what the music on is on. And literally my sermon, and that mini sermon, they labeled it online, is about the bride waiting for the groom and the Lord rescuing us, which we are in desperate need, every single one of us tonight. A lot of people feel like they have to have a white and black occurrence in their life for the Lord to come and save them. Everyone thinks they need this crazy encounter to meet with their Lord, and that's not the truth. In the scripture, wherever Jesus went, the multitudes went, and many times there were blind people or people who needed healing that met Jesus as he encountered the town. There were people who grabbed on his robe, and he turned around and healed them. And so tonight, we don't need this black and white encounter with the Lord. We've already encountered the Lord. And if you haven't, he's available here tonight. It, I like what Adi Tisha always said, even at camp. It's time that you guys have fruit. It's time that all this accumulation and time you guys have spent at youth, prayer, Thursdays, practices, this accumulation of time in God's house should have an accumulation of his word. You guys should have a deep understanding and knowledge at this point that when we come and preach to you, a lot of the passages we read or are said at the pulpit should be triggered from your own Bible studies, from your own reading. And so when I come to you guys and I bring you uh, maybe a deeper understanding, I need you guys to understand because I'm expecting a lot from you. We had such a great, powerful weekend at Winterfest, and if you didn't encounter God at Winterfest, you have to be real with yourself. Are you serving the Lord? Are you seeking the Lord? Does it still bother you when God is silent? Are you sorrowful when you sin? Does the Holy Spirit and the conscience bother you when you fall into sin? And if your answer is no, then you're not in the right place tonight. Spiritually, you need to analyze your life. Because it's a great tragedy to hear from the Lord and not hear from the Lord anymore. And so I need your full attention as we dive into the word tonight. I didn't want to read a lot, but I'm going to read just to emphasize. The, um, basically, I've, 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 always, <clears throat> I've always spoke about this. I had so many topics to preach on for Friday. It could have been peace in the valley, let's go cliche, defend your faith, right, from Winterfest. But nothing, it didn't, it didn't work for me. I know a sermon is from the Lord when it excites me to preach it to you guys. And last night as Adi was preaching... Certain passages came in my head, and that's what my sermon is tonight. Everyone believes that Jesus is only merciful, or God is only merciful in the New Testament. But all of the Old Testament paves the way of Jesus, paves the way of God's mercy. And a lot of people look at the Old Testament, and all they see is the law and God's wrath. But tonight we'll see God's faithfulness and God's mercy in the Old Testament. So tonight, here's my my endem. Seek the merciful God. Let me show you again what a merciful God looks like. A lot of people tend to use the one side of God and use scare tactics to bring you closer to the Lord. But let me show you how good God's mercy is and his grace and how we can still be uh, reverent in his grace. We're going to go to Nehemiah chapter 9. It's going to be very hard for the guys at Stotsit to follow me because I'm going to read, but I'm going to stop. This is the verse that I always talk about to you guys, where um, the people come before the Lord, and here's a heads up. It's the seventh month of the year, and they have 24 days of church. They're on day 24. They're already fasting. They have dust on their head. They have sath cloths to show their repentance. And they're on the 24th day, and they're coming before the Lord, and they're reminding the Lord and the people what they did, what God did, what they did when they sinned, how they cried out, and how God took them back. So that's what I'm going to read a little bit more tonight. I want you guys to see how God blessed them, 
how they left the Lord, how they cried out to the Lord, how they came back to the Lord. There's going to be a lot of examples I'm going to read fast. I have them highlighted as what God did and what the people did. And the only reason I'm spending more time on this passage is so it can stick to you guys, right? Because this is not just one occurrence. This is the summary of Israel in one passage of their unfaithfulness as a bride, how they cheated against the Lord, how they wavered, have been, uh, how Elijah says, they've wavered amongst two opinions, meaning two masters. And if you find yourself in that place tonight where you, you're serving the Lord and other idols, you need to return to the Lord. You know why the Lord calls them stiff-necked to Israel, meaning stubborn, pig-headed, unwilling to learn? Because they worship idols who are fake, stiff-necked. Those gods cannot move because they are fake. So God has to call them what they worship, stiff-necked. So tonight, let's come before the Lord, and I'm going to go very, very quickly through the sermons, and I want you to catch God's grace, because you're in catching Israel in God's grace, you're going to catch how God has grace over you. Trust me when I say this, everyone looks at the Old Testament and thinks, well, that has no relevance to me, uh, and, it, and it will. Here we go. They start off in verse uh, Nehemiah chapter 9, and I'm just going very quickly, verse 6. They're blessing the Lord. Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever, and I'm going to skip Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all other blessings. You alone are the Lord. You are the Lord God who chose Abraham and gave him, and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you. God made a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, and the Girishites, to give to his descendants. You have performed your words, for you are righteous. Amen. Here's God. You saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry by the Red Sea. You showed signs and wonders against Pharaoh, against all their servants, and against all the people of his land. For you knew they acted proudly against him, so you made a name for yourself, as it is this day. And you divided the sea before them, so they went through the midst of the sea on the dry land. And their persecutors you threw into the deep as a stone in the mighty waters. Moreover, meaning... Continuing, moreover, you led, by, you led them by day with a cloud, cloudy pillar and by night with a pillar of fire to give them the light on the road which they should travel. You came down also on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them just ordinances and true laws, good statutes and commandments. You made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them precepts, statutes, and laws. By the hand of Moses, your servant, you gave them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought them water out of the rock of their thirst and told them to go and to possess the land which you had sworn to give them. Here's Israel's response. But they had, but they and our fathers acted proudly, hardened their necks and did not heed your word, your commandments. They refused to obey and they were not mindful of your wonders that you did among them, but they hardened their necks and in their rebellion they appointed a leader to return to their bondage. Here's God. But you are God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and did not forsake them. Israel's response. Even when they made a gold, a molded calf for themselves and said, this is your God that brought you out of Egypt and worked great provocations. Yet, this is the Lord, yet in your manful mercies, you did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of the cloud did not depart from them by day to lead them on the road, nor the pillar of fire by night to show them light and, they, and the way they should go. You also gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing and their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. Moreover, you gave them the kingdoms and nations and divided them into districts. And so they took possession of the land of Sihon and land of the king of Heshbon and the land of Og, king of Bashan. You also multiplied their children as the stars of heaven and brought them into the land which you told their fathers. I'm going to skip down because it's a longer reading. And they took strong cities and a rich land and possessed houses of full of goods. And we're going to go down to 26. Here's Israel's response, being unfaithful. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your law behind their backs. And they killed your prophets who testified against them to turn them into yourself. And they worked great provocations. Therefore, you delivered them into the hand of their enemies who oppressed them. In the time of their trouble, when they cried out to you, God's returning, you heard from heaven, and according to your abundant mercies, you gave them de deliverers who saved them from the hand of their enemies. But after they had rest, they again did evil before you. Therefore, you left them in the hand of your enemies. Verse 29, and, and testified against them that you might bring them back to your law. 
going to skip instead of reading everything. Verse 30, the Lord, yet for many years you had patience with them and testified against them by your spirit, your prophets. Yet they would not listen, therefore you gave them into the hand of the peoples of the lands. Nevertheless, in your great mercy, you did not utterly consume them for your name's sake, for you kept your covenant and mercy. In verse 33, the last one, however, you are just in all that has befallen us, for you have dealt faithfully, but we have done wickedly. Amen. In God's judgment, he is still merciful. When we act wickedly, he's still faithful. Some of you tonight won't come to the Lord even when chaos surrounds you. So let me invite you with his grace. We are a bride that cheats. We ourselves have been sold short to the highest bidder. We have been unfaithful, yet God takes us back every time we run away from home. Every time we run off with another God. Every time we run off with another bride, groom. Yet look how the Lord continues to treat us and how he treats Israel. Time after time after time after time, he remains to be faithful. Amen. When they lose their way, they remember their covenant with the Lord, and the Lord takes them back. If you find yourself tonight rebellious, distant from the Lord, unsure how the Holy Spirit feels, there's an opportunity to return. I just literally read and I shortened it, the lifespan of Israel, how they cheated on the Lord and they cried out, and yet when they cried out, the Lord just automatically took them back. In the Bible, uh, the scripture says that uh, David was a man after own God's heart. After Saul fell, it is the king's duty to go and to attack the house of the enemy, meaning Saul. David appears at the house of Jonathan, which, who's uh, Saul's son, right? Everybody is hiding, thinking that David's coming to kill them. Jonathan had a son, so Saul's grandson basically was a cripple. His name was Mephibosheth. David comes to the house and says, is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? David comes, who is a representation of the Lord. He comes and he passionately pursues the house of Jonathan. Ziba, who's the house servant, comes and says, it's me and the only um, offspring of Saul is Mephibosheth and he's hiding. So bring him to me. He comes before David, hides his face in the Lord, and basically David says, going forward, you are going to eat at the king's table. Mephibosheth has a son, and he names him Micah, which means, who is a God like you? God is like David. He comes, and he passionately pursues you guys tonight. And we are so embarrassed of our sin, we hide. And when God calls us forward, God says, I want you to eat at my table. Right? There's scripture for this. Jesus tells the parable of the, the king who, who prepares a feast for the son, who sends the messengers who get killed who come back and then they're like, okay, well, tell everybody to come off the streets, right? And then there's a parable of the prodigal son that when the sinner, the son comes back to his right mind and comes to his father's house, prepare the fattest calf, let's, we're gonna have a party, let's have a feast. God is passionately pursuing you like Israel. Don't let anybody make you feel inferior. Yes, we're ashamed when we sin, but God is graceful. If we come and repent and acknowledge our sin before him, he is faithful to receive us and we can be restored in the name of Jesus tonight. A lot of us, <clears throat> we have this God that is so merciful, yet we remain on the sideline. As if only we can come to him only at Winterfest or big events. Why do we have to wait for big events to encounter God? You can respond to God tonight. And in your response, we're going to have a moment of prayer. Pray as long as you want. How come we can only pray at uh, Winterfest two hours, but we can't pray at our own church? There's no, I'm sorry, there's no time frame. There's, there's nothing to rush here. We need to be restored. We need to be rehabilitated in our spiritual walk. We are coming to church with spiritual crutches, and God is expecting more from us. And he just wants to kick those spiritual crutches and be, and be like, guys, come on. I have greater expectation from you. There's nothing hindering you tonight from worshiping the Lord freely, meaning to come before him as we repent, for God to rehabilitate you, for God's mercy 
to restore you, to give you new measurement and refreshing of his spirit tonight so that when you walk out through these doors, you're not the same person who left, that you have strength, a reserve, fuel, power to praise his name and to act accordingly to his name. One last thing. <clears throat> in Micah, and I posted this this week on Instagram, this is our Lord, Micah, verse 18 and 19. And who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression? Those who break the law, transgression, of the remnant, those left over. It's like having a piece of cloth and you're at the last strand of his inheritance. What is this saying? There's still mercy for the a foreshadow of the Gentiles that are coming. The remnant, meaning the leftover. There's still power left over for the next generation that is coming. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us and he will subdue our iniquities. You will cast out all our sins in the depths of the sea. Amen. I want you guys to stand up and we're going to go into prayer. I need you guys to analyze your life tonight. If you haven't heard from the Lord, if you don't remember how his voice is, you, you need him tonight. If you come to church just to have an appointment, just to show up at church, you need him tonight. If you don't know how to pray and you don't have fruits, you definitely need him tonight. If you are a sinner, as all of us are, you need him tonight. So let us come before the Lord as the band plays a little bit of music in the background. Let's come before the Lord. Let us repent of our sins. Let's acknowledge the one who stands before us, the one who has compassion over us, the one who returns time and time and time and time again when we cry out, when we're unfaithful, when we, uh, when we leave to another bridegroom and we cry out, he still remembers our voice. Let's come before the Lord and let him have mercy on us. In Jesus' name, amen.
sitting, tattling in front of God and saying, look at him, he sinned again, and look at her, she's fallen. You feel alone, but tonight, the beautiful words of this song remind you that somebody's standing next to you. If you need to feel that fire, brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit fire, not the fire of this world, I want you to come before the Lord tonight and cry out to him this moment to ask the Holy Spirit to lift you back up on your feet, to remind you that you're more than what the world tells you that you are, that you are a child of God.
Thank you for your son on the cross. Thank you for freedom. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit over these young people's lives, Lord. Lord, I pray you fill us. Use us as a generation of revival, Lord. I pray you pour out your spirit over this young generation, Lord. The lean church, you fill us with the power that sets you free. The power that brings life and light in this dark world, hallelujah. Lord, you know what these young people are going through, Lord. Let your spirit pick them up. Let your spirit heal them. Empower them to be children of the light, Lord, hallelujah. Tonight, with addiction, break the chains, Lord, and set them free. If there's young people that are depressed, Lord, renew their mind with the freedom that comes of being your child. Hallelujah. Lord, as they cry out tonight, hear their pleas, Lord, answer their cries, say something next to you. God is good. The Holy Spirit is good. Come on, somebody. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Shake somebody's hand. Have a seat. Man, it's going to be hard to preach after that. The Lord is good. Amen? The Holy Spirit is good. Amen? Thank you, God, for Jesus. Thank you for tonight. Young people, it's good to be here. Um, that song, I don't know, something about that song always gets me just tugs at my heart, and, and it, it, it's just a good reminder. Uh, as Brother Dennis said, it's, it, it's amazing how the Holy Spirit works. Uh, we, we, we get called by Pastor Adi. Pastor Adi says, prepare a sermon, and you rack your brain. What do I got written down from before? What can I reuse? What, can I, what have I been studying? And, and you let the Holy Spirit speak to you. And tonight, um, I want to talk a little bit about the, the battle, this war. And the song is so beautiful. Uh, it, it talks about being in the middle of a fire. And, and if you don't know the story of, of, of who this song is based on, it, it's the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, three young men that were taken and captive in the midst of war, brought to a strange land, and forced to be slaves under a new regime. And tonight we're going to talk a little bit about war. Uh, we're going to continue to pray for the... the Believers in Ukraine, the people of Ukraine, and, and God have peace and mercy. Uh, war is ugly. And it's, it's a disgusting reminder, young people, that we're always in a battle. Uh, we're in a battle, a spiritual battle, not flesh and blood, uh, even though we see it with our eyes. Uh, the battle that we fight is a battle of life and death every waking moment. And, and the, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego gives us the stage of what I want to talk to you about tonight. These three young people that did not bow down to the customs, to the evil, to the worship demanded by the king of, his, of their time. They did not compromise. They kept their mind clean and said, we're going to worship God. And it cost them what? Being thrown into the midst of the fire. In an entire country where everybody's bowing down before the idol that the king created, three young men stood proud and tall. And their punishment was to be thrown into the pits of fire, into the burning cauldron of fire. And then we hear the wonderful song, uh, standing in the midst of the fire of somebody who was by their side. And the king looks and he says, didn't we throw three men in the flames? Yet why is there four with the fourth one looking like the image of God? Hallelujah. Young people, uh, we're a Pentecostal church. Some of you have been baptized by the Holy Spirit when we had Staruinsa. Some of you had an amazing experience where you tasted the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, when Jesus Christ was on earth with us, he said, uh, I'm going to heaven to prepare a place for you, but I'm going to send you a helper so you're not alone. And no matter what you're going through tonight, 
before I started preaching, I, I had it on my heart. The Holy Spirit was telling me, some of you feel, you guys are fighting this, this feeling like you're all alone. I want to tell you you're not. You're struggling with something and people don't understand. Your parents don't, the devil has whispered lies to you. We're going to get about that tonight. But you're not alone. There's somebody in the midst of that fire with you. And God gives us the Holy Spirit as the helper. The, 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 the taste of God's goodness that you're not alone. Amen. What a beautiful song. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, tonight, I, I want to take a few minutes to talk about, you know, uh, the war that we're in. Yeah, you know, all week we've been hearing for the last two weeks, but specifically the last couple of days, all over social media, all over the news, all we hear about is war. And war is nasty. War is ugly. Uh, our grandparents fought in wars. Our great-grandparents uh, experienced World War II. Uh, there's civil wars go going on in, in countries. Thank God we've been at peace. As a, as a young generation, none of us have tasted war, none of us have seen it. We've read about it in history books. We're seeing it unfold live in front of our eyes. It's ugly. Uh, some of you were too young to know, you know, what happened 20 years ago in Afghanistan. Um, you know, I was a kid, but I remember watching on TV, you, you see just jets flying over Afghanistan and bombs everywhere. And you look online and, and you see these gruesome images of bodies everywhere. It, it's scary. It's sad. Uh, thank God we're not going through it now. But it's a good reminder that, brothers and sisters, we live every life uh, in the flesh and bone, but we're more than that. As believers, we're called to live and fight the fight in the spiritual realm, too. I know you've heard about this a lot, but um, I, I want to at least plant this idea in your heads that you're at war. Whether you ever go to physical war here on this earth or not, every day is a battle. And it's a good reminder for us as Christians to keep in mind and remember every day is a battle between life and death. Um, the Bible says we're a spiritual, uh, you know, we don't see it, it's hard to grasp, but there's a war raging inside of you every single day. So it's often said that our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. Our lives are always moving, our feet are going, our life is going in the direction of our strongest thoughts. What you think is what you are. What you think is where you're going. The first little thing you have in your head that says, I want to do this, your feet will lead you to it. Now, uh, you know, Shakespeare said, I think, therefore I am, right? The famous quote, uh, the idea that what you are starts up here. And over the years, the more we understand this idea, uh, we start to become better equipped. You know, you start to know, okay, I want to be a doctor, I know where my feet are going. I want to be a carpenter, I'm going to go to carpentry school. I want to be a plumber, you're going to play with toilets. I want to be an electrician, you're going to get shocked every other day. You know, whatever your brain thinks, whatever thoughts you let affect you up here is the direction you're going to go. Now, you don't have to take just my word for it. It's not just me saying this. Uh, both the Bible and, believe it or not, even modern science say the same thing, right? We're living in a world where uh, the word science it used to be something you'd study for in school, uh, and it'd be paper mache volcanoes and experiments. Um, for the last two years, all we've heard about is you know, the science, the science, the science. Trust the science. Follow the science. And, you know, all science is is testing out theories to find out something, right? So let's break this down. Uh, the Bible and modern science say the same thing. Open with me to Philippians chapter 4. I just want to read verses 8 and 9. Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. The Bible says the following. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble... Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, keyword here, think about such things. Verse 9 says, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. Now, in just these short two verses, the Apostle Paul, he says, think, think about such things, then he moves into action, put into practice, he says, followed by the experience, the outcome, which is the God of peace will be with you. Now, that's the biblical version saying, hey, whatever you're thinking up here, think about the good things, put it into action, 
and God of peace will be with you. Uh, psychologists kind of came to the same conclusion. Uh, there's a modern science called cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, it's the study of many behaviors, mental and behavioral patterns, right? So cognitive behavioral therapy says that uh, things like eating disorders, uh, relationships, problems, uh, addictions, depression, the science says that these problems or these, the fix to these problems can start with your brain. It all starts with your brain. Now, uh, the best part about all of this is that 3,000 years ago, uh, God gave uh, Solomon the wisdom to write in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7. Listen, this is 3,000 years before modern science. Proverbs 23, verse says, 7 says, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Well, maybe I got the wrong, the wrong verse. Somewhere in Proverbs, Proverbs probably 22 or verse 7. But the Bible says, as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Amen. So if both the Bible and modern science say the same thing, what goes on up here leads to your actions, leads to your thoughts. What is it said over there? For as he thinks, that's how he is. Cognitive behavior therapy says, if you could change the way you think, you can fix all the problems. If you think good and you think right, boom, problem solved. Now, the difference between uh, reading the Bible and modern science, science will say, oh, you have to take drugs that make you dumber so that you're not angry. You have to take drugs that make you calm so you don't have depression. You have to take brains that regulate this. Science plays with one switch to try to fix another. And yet the Bible says, look, the one who creates the heart can fix the heart. And the one who created you knows your problems, and he knows how to twist your heart where it needs to be. He knows how to change your mind. So you see, when we're talking about spiritual warfare, um, you know, I, I don't want to just talk about like, the, the conflict in Ukraine, but it, it's a great reminder, young people, that there's a battle that we face every day, and it starts up here. Every morning that you wake up, you're faced with two choices. Uh, you, you guys seen the cartoons. You got the devil on your shoulder and an angel, you know, little devil with wings, a little angel with wings. The devil whispers in your ears, oh, let's do something bad. The angel says, no, let's do something good. Uh, it turns out that, you know, that's not that far off. Except the Bible doesn't say that there's angels. The Bible says that internally we have the flesh and we have the spirit of God. And every single day it's a war. Uh, so many examples, somebody said it's like a dog. You have two dogs living inside of you. And whichever dog you feed more is the dog that comes on top. So if you feed the good dog, the dog that's righteous, the dog that's spiritual, he's going to devour and overcome the evil dog. But if you, defeat, if you feed the evil dog, the flesh, your body, your lusts, the human emotions in your heart, it starts up here. That dog wins. Now, you might not be going through wars again physically here, but uh, you're not punching any bad guys. You're not physically going out to war. Uh, but that action, that fight that you're fighting against the flesh, it's your choice on how you fight every single day. Um, look over here. Oh, nobody's going to pay attention to you. Look over there. It's a dark room. Nobody knows what you're doing. Oh, one puff. You're not going to get addicted. Just a little drink. You know, nobody's paying attention. It doesn't matter. You're not going to get drunk. Oh, just, just, it's not a big sin. Everybody says, oh, you can go there. Your parents don't know what they're talking about. They're so old school. Oh, you just have to spend hours playing video games instead of reading the Bible. Oh, you don't have to come to church on Sundays or Tuesdays. Just come on Fridays and you're good. The flesh wants to do things that please the flesh. And the spirit fights against those things. The Apostle Paul said he treats his body roughly so that it doesn't, so it submits to the spirit and not to the flesh. This battle that we fight every single day, it's important. Like we said a few minutes ago, where your biggest thoughts are up here will determine where your steps and what direction you go. So if we're fighting a war, the first thing you want to do for war is you want to have your weapons ready, right? When you're fighting a battle, you don't want to just go out in the field, you know, dressed in your pajamas, you wake up out of the in, you know, in the morning, you're ready for battle, and you're going out to war in your PJs, all right? That's not, that's, nobody does that. Uh, you look out online right now, you have the Ukrainian government giving 14-year-olds rifles. You're giving them weapons, grenade launchers. Uh, battle is ugly. And to win a battle, to defeat the enemy, you need weapons. 
And the Bible tells us that there's some weapons that, you know, we have to practice. We have to get used to it. Now, um, perfect example of Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus Christ goes to meet John the Baptist, and he gets baptized. Gets dunked in water, dove above, the Holy Spirit confirming, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. All of a sudden, Jesus goes to the desert, 40 days, 40 nights fasting. And wouldn't you happen to know that as soon as that's over, Satan comes to try to tempt him, right? Jesus is preparing for battle. He's fasting. He's putting on his armor. Satan comes, the first attack. So if, if, if you don't know what happened, go home and read cha Matthew chapter 4. But a summary of it goes like this, because we don't have time. Uh, Satan knew Jesus was hungry. 40 days, hungry. So what did he do? He tempted. He said, Jesus, look, there's stones. If you're really the Son of God and you're hungry, turn them to bread. Do something that, you know, God doesn't have part of your plan. Just do it. You know, he did the same thing to Adam and Eve, right? Just that, that, that fruit, it's, it's so appealing. It's so good. Just take it. I know God said not to. Just take it. And it wasn't Jesus' time. So what did Jesus do? He turned around and he quoted scripture. He said, man should not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from God. He said this in Deuteronomy. He was quoting Deuteronomy 8.3. So the first thing Jesus did when he was tempted, when he was at war, he responded with scripture. He said, Satan, look, the Bible tells that it, we don't live just on bread. We got to live on the word of God. So Satan he sees that he fails. What does he do? He tries again. Now pay attention. This is going to happen to all of you. I promise you. Especially if you go to get baptized. As soon as you decide to get baptized, oh boy, the Satan's going to come roaring like a lion. And he's going to come in 40 days of peace. But as soon as that's over, mm, get ready. All your old friends are coming back. Satan sees that the first try failed, so he does it again. Takes him to the highest point, the temple. He says, you know what? Jump off. You know, Satan says, you know how to quote scripture? So do I. So Satan says, oh, you, you know, scriptures uh, says you will he will command his angels and they will lift you up, so you want to strike your foot against the stone. Are you really Jesus, the son of God? Prove it. Throw yourself off this and then see if God saves you. What does Jesus do? Same thing, uses scripture, and it quotes Deuteronomy 6, verse 16. It says, do not put your Lord, the Lord your God, to the test. Shuts him, Satan down again. So Satan's like, okay, maybe the third time, the third strike, that's it. This is the third strike. This is, is going to be the best, this is going to be my best attempt. So he takes him to the top of a mountain. And Satan says to, to Jesus, look, everything that your eyes, this kingdom is mine. Everything you can see with your eyes, it's mine. I'll give it to you. Just bow down and worship me. Bow down and worship me. Jesus says, away from me, Satan, quoting Deuteronomy 6, 13 again. He says, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Amen. Now, all of this is done to perfectly illustrate the tool or the weapon we need to use in this war, this war of, uh, uh, that we're fighting with, our brains, our flesh against the spirit, right? You're never going to arm wrestle your spirit against your flesh. Uh, you're never going to look in the mirror and say, you know, I'm going to battle you. It, it takes place up here. And what's the number one tool, one, one number one weapon? Uh, Jesus gives it to us three separate times, three separate temptations. All Jesus does is he exposes Satan's lies and he uses scripture to combat. Young people, I, I can't stress this enough. The Bible is so important for your salvation and for your souls at a young age. Listen, all of you guys are going to school and school is not the same as it used to be 20 years ago. I promise you that. 50 years ago, let's not even talk about in Romania, right? In Romania school, you know what they did? They'd send you home and they said, by the end of tomorrow, you got to memorize 10 pages. And you know what your class was? Trece in fata, get to the front of the board. All right, what did you memorize from last night? You want to talk about math problems? Oh, Johnny had seven apples, uh, Sarah had six, and then they combined them, and, and their dog ate three. No, in Romania, it was, listen, you're learning the algebra, you're learning all these formulas, and tomorrow you're going on the chalkboard, and you're showing us what you learned. School is different now. You guys got the core system. Yeah, I, I can't wrap my brain around it. I don't know what's going on. It used to be you just stack the numbers, you add them, you subtract them, and that's it. Now you got to round to the nearest 15th, dis divide by 12, call your mom for a lifeline, and then figure out what the solution is. It's crazy. I'm telling you, school is not the same. And the stuff, I promise you, God is my witness, the stuff that they're teaching you now is toxic. It's poison. It really is. 
even simple things like math now involve something evil and, and political and believe it or not, spiritual to it. And if you're not reading your Bible, the problem is you're going to go to school and all these theories and ideas that school presents you, man, they sure sound like they're true. They sure sound like they know what they're talking about. These scientists that are writing these textbooks, oh boy. I've had some conversations with people in our church about this confusion, about gender confusion. Man, that stuff starts in school and it's toxic. It's dangerous. And if you don't read your Bible, you're in trouble. Because what happens, you go to school and you become desensitized. And you start to think that what they're saying is right when the Bible and Scripture tells us it's wrong. And all they do is chip away at God's armor, the blessing that your parents prayed for you. They chip away, chip away, chip away until they can put a little worm inside your brain and change the way you think. And our number one tool, the number one defense, the Jesus Christ, the Son of God, showed us the number one tool we can use is Scripture. Amen. Young people, read your Bibles. I can't stress this enough. Let's call it what it is. It's the sword of truth. Uh, the lie replacement sword, right? If there's a lie, use the sword of God, boom, replace that lie. Cut it down. It only works if you read it. You don't know how to respond to Satan, get behind me, Satan, or don't tempt me, or the word of God says in Deuteronomy, if you don't read your Bible. And when the Satan comes and your teachers come and, and your bad friends at school come and they said, oh, that's not a lie. Oh, that's not a lie. That's not a sin. Oh, you could drink a little bit. You can get drunk. Oh, you could drink, just don't get drunk. Oh, you could, do, you could compromise before marriage, just don't go all the way. Lies. And if you don't read your Bible, you don't know how to respond. And you get overcome little by little. Now, reading, and not just reading, remembering, memorizing, applying what you learn is so important. If you fill your brains with the truth, you're going to walk in the truth. If you fill it with Netflix and Instagram and Snapchat and, Inst and, and Facebook and all the lies that the world posts, you're going to walk in those lies. If all you're doing is competing against other people's virtual image, you're going to be disappointed. Because behind every perfect picture, there's failures, there's fakeness, there's problems. Everything you read and see online or from your friends at school is not real. I'll tell you what is. The Word of God. And when you're in the middle of the fire, like that song says, you can stand strong because there's somebody next to you. Amen. You know, there was a study, this disgusting, disgusting. It breaks my heart to think that my children are, are going to grow up in this world. There was a study that said that right now on Snapchat and Instagram, there's a lot in TikTok. It, it, TikTok is the worst. You guys shouldn't have that on your phones. But listen to me. There was a study that showed that Young adolescents that are exposed to self-diagnosing medical problems. For example, uh, this was specifically on multiple personality disorders. Lots of trending TikToks for people your age. How to self-diagnose if you're a schizophrenic or if you have multiple personalities. Ah, not only is it cringeworthy, the problem is a lot of people fall for it. People fall for it, and they watch this funny TikToker, Instagrammer, influencer, and they spread this poison. Oh, if you're feeling down today, uh, you might have clinical depression. Guys, in, in my time, there was no such thing as depression. It was a cloudy day. It, it was boring. That's all we had. Either it was fun or it was boring, right? I'm 34 years old. That's all I remember in my childhood. At 13 years old, there was no depression. There was either I was bored or I was having the time of my life. We were outside playing soccer. We were, you know, doing stupid things and riding bicycles around town. Or we were inside because it was raining and bored. And today, Satan comes and he, he tricks your minds and he exposes you to things that you shouldn't be exposed to. You know the Bible, if you read your Bible, the Bible says, don't awaken it's so important. Listen, it says, don't awaken the, the youthful desires before their time. Oh, man. Oh, man, the dangers that you young people are exposed to at this age. You know what youthful desires are? It's awakening your hormones before they're ready to be awakened. 30 years ago, dating was different than it is today. Today, it's dangerous, it's a minefield. Because you're going out on a date and you don't know what minefield you're going to step on, what bombs you're going to explode. And the people you're talking to have so much baggage because they're going out and exploring and, and oh, I have depression and oh, I don't get along with my parents because they don't understand me. 
because they're not reading the Bible. Back in the day, again, it was either you were having fun or you were bored. The date consisted of it was a boring date, I didn't like her, or it was a great date, let's go on another one. You guys have it, you guys really have it tough. And, and it breaks my heart. Honestly, it breaks my heart. And if you're not reading your Bible, you don't know how to approach it. It's, it's the most dangerous thing. Look, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. This is so important. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. How do you do this if you don't read the Bible to know what's a good thought and what's a bad thought? What thought comes from the Word of God, the truth of Scripture, or what thought was planted there by the evil of this world? How do you know which, which, which thoughts to capture, to crush, and to eliminate? I'll tell you how. Open your Bible. Psalm 119, verses 9, 10, and 11. Psalm 119, verses 9, 10, 11. How do you distinguish? How do you know which thought to keep active, captive? How do you know which thought to destroy? Verse 9. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word, or by living according to your word. It says, uh, at the top it says, with my whole heart, go back, with my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Look at the translation below it. I have hidden your word in my heart. I will seek you with all my heart, or I will... I will seek with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commandments. You guys, stop changing your translation on me. And next verse, verse 11, it says, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. So how do you know not to sin? How do you know to avoid temptation? How do you know which thought, whatever brain, whatever thought enters your brain is good, which one is bad? By using God's word as a filter. And we're not doing enough of that today, young people. I can't stress this enough. We have to read our Bibles more. There is no other book that's more important. There is no other novel that you should waste your time. There's no scientific book that will tell you how to become a better person, no matter how many times you read it. There's no book on depression that you could read that will cure it. The Bible is the answer to all of our problems. I promise you this. And we know how this sword works, right? The sword of truth. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says... For the Word of God, the Bible, is living and active, or powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Amen. Do you guys realize what, what, what these verses are saying? In this war that we're fighting, in this battle, not with flesh and blood, but against the darkness, against evil, against temptation, against depression, against your, your gender ideology, the stupid things that they teach you at school, the way you're able to discern, the way you're able to cut it down is with the Word of God because it's active, it's sharper, more sharper than any church, uh, other sword of this world. It's living and it pierces. It can separate flesh and blood, spirit and soul, and the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Imagine that. The Bible could tell you when you need to change your thoughts and when you need to change your heart. You know why? Because from the depths of your heart, you know, the mouth speaks, the Bible says. From the depths of your core of your heart, who you are, how your mind thinks starts here. And the Word of God, you know what it can do? The Word of God can go into your heart and get rid of all the nasty things that have been put in there, whether it's been put in there by school, whether it's been put in there by your friends, whether it's been put in there by your bad relationships. The Word of God is the sword that can come in and separate the bad from the good and let you walk in the truth. Uh, I'll move on. Time is short here. The second weapon or tool that we can use in this war um, is the rewiring tool. Right? Rewiring something, when you change the wires, uh, you, you, how can you rewire, rewire your brain and renew your mind? Um, you guys have heard the word trigger used a lot, right? Uh, you know, in college campuses, uh, there's certain trigger words where people start to, ah, freak out and, you know, it, it, you laugh because you're like, dude, what's wrong with you? You know, you say he instead of she and it's a trigger word. And people start to, you know, that's Satan. I promise you, that's Satan working. So uh, there, there's words and there's things that trigger the world. There's words and things that might trigger us. 
in a good way or a bad way. It, it, you know, sometimes it's called PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, right? That's where the idea comes from. If you've been to war and, it, it, you know, your friends die next to you, you, you come home and there's fireworks and all of a sudden the fireworks explode and, you know, you hear, you start to freak out. You're triggered. Well, they took PTSD and they corrupted it. And now you get triggered by some people get triggered by the word Jesus. They're so full of Satan, they get angry that you talk about God. And you can't talk to people about God. But in our daily walk, in our daily war against the sin of this world, there's triggers that can trigger us. And Satan lets these triggers here to have you walk down the same path of sin again. So, for example, if you're going to go, if, if every single day you walk by a bar, and you're, you, you smell the smell of alcohol, it triggers in you this t thirst for beer. And how did it start? Well, it started when you were in school and your friend said drink a little bit. Or you're, you're, you're walking down the street and you smell the smoke of marijuana and it triggers this appetite to smoke a joint. Because in the past, you've experimented with drugs and you think, I'm not addicted, but you get triggered by Satan. And unless you're reading your Bible, young people, how do you rewire your brain? How do you change your mind? The Bible says the metanoia, the, the renewing of your mind, the experience of knowing Jesus Christ to make you a new creation. How do you do that? It starts by reading the Bible. You know, there's, we all have problems. We all have issues. Money, when you're older, can't afford a car, can't afford a house, can't afford food. Um, relationship problems. You know, we live in a very wealthy country, so, you know, money shouldn't be a problem necessarily. Just because you're not driving expensive cars, uh, you might have relationship problems. Stuff that money can't fix. Uh, you can have an addiction problem. You have an addictive personality and you, you fell down a slippery slope and now you're addicted to stuff. No matter what the issue is, Scripture tells us and there's promises from God. Young people, no matter what situation you're going through, I can promise you one thing. Millions of people behind you have already been through it. Millions of people after you will go through it. And there's still the same number one solution for all of them. The words of Jesus Christ on paper. The living word of God which can set you free. It can change your mind and take you out from depression. It can change your mind and take you out from addiction. Break those chains. It's the word of God. Listen, Philippians chapter 4 verse 12. It says, Apostle Paul's writing to Philippians. He says, I know how to be brought low. And I know how to uh, abound. In any and every circumstances, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. The Apostle Paul knew he went through all these experiences with Jesus Christ, with Jesus Christ, to get to the conclusion on the other side that he can go through it without or with. Poor, rich, having, not having. Moving on, Philippians 4.19 says, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory. Hallelujah. But, uh, that, that's for material problems, right? Uh, look at Romans 12, verse 2. 12, verse 2. Apostle Paul writes to the Romans, he says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern the will of God. What is the will of God? What is good, acceptable, and perfect? The will of God. How? When you read the Bible, when you open your eyes and you read the living word, the scripture, the, fi the, the, the fiery sword that can separate f f falseness from truthness, you'll see that this is the pattern of the world and this is the image of Christ. And the more I am like Christ, the less I'll be like the world. And I'll rewire my brain, I'll renew my mind so that I'm not like them. I'm not like the, the evil, the corrupt, the sin that has made man fallen. And I could be made more like Christ, perfect in his image so that I'm not addicted, so that my relationships thrive. You guys are going to get married when you're younger. You know, the most important thing, I, I, I listened to a sermon and a pastor said, look, when you're married, please pay attention to this. Your relationship between you and your wife or you and your husband is an exact replica of your relationship between you and Christ. The way you and your wife relate to one another is 100% reflected in the way you or, and her have your relationship with Jesus Christ. Imagine that. Even to the level of relationship, your relationship with Christ will determine the outcome of your marriage. And it's so important. Guys, we live in a fallen world. Sin is everywhere around us. 
bad things happen to good people because we're in a fallen world. But the Bible promises that if we stick close to God, even in those bad circumstances, he makes a way. So, rewiring your brain. Let's look at the Apostle Paul here. He was the goat, right? You guys know goat. That's a modern term. Uh, the greatest of all time. Dude, this guy was one of the greatest of all time apostles. The Christian faith is based on the, the letters that this guy wrote. You guys know the story of Apostle Paul, right? He was Saul before. He was a persecutor of the Christians. He killed Christians. And one day he's walking and he gets, boom, encounter with God. Jesus Christ blinds him. Blind. The persecutor of Christians has a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. And gives his soul to, he gives his soul to the Lord. He receives his sight and he goes out and he preaches the gospel. Now, if, if you read the Bible, you can see just how much God rewired this man's brain. Filled him with the power of the Holy Spirit. Renewed who he was, a new creation, to walk in the power of God. Paul wanted to spread the gospel. Right? We, we don't have a lot of time to talk about this, so I'll be, I'll be quick here. But he wanted to, to spread the gospel. And you said, the fastest way that I could spread the gospel in the whole world to share this great, amazing news about Jesus Christ, I'm going to go to Rome. I'm going to go to Rome, the capital of the Roman Empire, and from there it's going to spread like water, wildfire. He had a plan. He said, you know what? Preach it. Preach it to the leaders. It's going to spread. Now, what happened? Well, when you have time, you study scriptures. Uh, Paul actually did make it to the Roman Empire. He was in Rome. He was a Roman citizen, right? But he didn't make it as a free man. Did you know that Apostle Paul was in Rome as a slave, uh, uh, as a, uh, excuse me, as a prisoner? Did you know that he was taken captive as a prisoner, put under house arrest, with guards watching him every single day? So he was waiting for his execution at any moment, causing civil unrest in the Roman Empire. But Paul prayed for an opportunity. He made the best of it. He said, Lord, I want to go to Rome. He found a way to get to Rome, but not the way that he might have imagined it. Put yourself in Paul's shoes, right? Would you count being arrested as winning? No. Getting taken to Rome where you wanted to go as a prisoner, stuck under house arrest, getting ready to be executed any day, is that a win? In my book, it's not. Uh, Paul did, you know? Yeah, some of us might be in his situation. And you're thinking, if only I could get that job. If only I could marry Mr. Wright. Oh, if only Miss USA Universe, uh, the, the super hot model of the church, would even know that I exist and I could date her. Oh boy, my life would be perfect. That's God's will for me. Oh man, <laughs> come on, is right. At your young age, you know this is the stuff that you're encountering. Oh, if only I could get into that school to become that doctor. That's my goal. Again, back to the dating thing. Oh, she doesn't even know you exist and you dream about her. And you, 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 your plan is, Lord, she's the one. I'm going to pray if she comes in with the purple about the next week, she's going to marry me. Doesn't work that way. And, and the Apostle Paul had a plan. Maybe you have a plan. It's not, you know, maybe it's God's will, maybe it's not. But how many times have you put yourself in that situation and then you end up with her? You go on a date or you go with him. And he chews his food like this. And his parents didn't teach him any manners. And you're like, this handsome, this handsome stud muffin is, he doesn't brush his teeth. He doesn't know how to chew. Ah. Man, you thought it was going to be God's will. Look at this, this handsome guy. And he's everything you dislike or, girl, or, or for the guys. Oh, man, she's the most beautiful girl in church. And you go out and you find out she doesn't even know how to say hi. She's just really shy. Or she's talking on her phone the whole time. Oh, you guys are, your brains don't work that way. You don't care. But life doesn't go as you plan it. And no matter how good you think, I'm a planner. I like to think ahead. I like to know what I'm doing tomorrow, three months from now. And I've always found that if you plan it and you, 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 know, you try to do something, it's good to be prepared. The Apostle Paul planned. You might be planning. But God's plan is not always your plan. Right? Paul, under the circumstances, he was a prisoner. He could have wrote to the letters uh, to the, the church of Philippi. He could have said to the Philippians, look, guys, my situation stinks. You know, I, I came, I tried to preach. I tried to preach the gospel, and I'm in prison. I'm ready to get executed any day. Praying doesn't work. I'm done with this. Instead, he didn't. His brain was rewired. 
because he was living scriptures at that time. And God uses him an example for you guys tonight to know this. You know what he did? Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. You know what he writes? He says, let's put it up on the screen. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Amen. He was in prison in chains, ready to be executed. And you know what he says? You know what? This is actually better than I could have imagined. And verse says 12, but and verse 13, uh, the next verse says, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And verse 14 says, and most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Amen. You see, what the Apostle Paul did is he took the word of God and he let it transform, the, the, he renewed his mind so that he looked at his circumstances. He found the circumstances that he's in and he wasn't depressed. He wasn't upset. You know what? He, he said, the will of God is so much better. I thought I would come in here and preach to the elite. Guess what? I'm preaching to the prisoner guards and it's so encouraging that even more people are being baptized and, and believing in Jesus than I would have even imagined. Because he did not let the world destroy his thoughts, his heart, his mind. He filled his heart with scripture. He had a personal relationship with Jesus that renewed his mind. It changed his mind. Young people, you can have that too by reading more of your Bible. Now, the goat, the boss Paul, the greatest of all time, he had a plan. God had a better one. Um, you guys have plans. It, it, it's getting late and I want to I, I close here. I want to talk about the other weapons later, but you guys make plans. You guys have things that you're, you're, you're stuck with. You know your situation. Read your Bibles. I can't stress this enough. Worship band, why don't you, you know, come back up here. I, 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 before we close, I want to sing another song or two, but let's all stand. Young people, we're, we're truly living the end times. Uh, I, I, wanna, I can't stress this enough. The Bible says that in the end times, you're going to hear, hear of wars, hurricanes, tornadoes. You'll hear of natural disasters. Every day, there's another natural disaster. It gets worse every year. We're hearing about wars every day. The Bible says even when these things happen, the end of the world won't happen yet, but it's coming. We're living at the edge of the end of times. Satan is roaring like a lion. Um, he wants to take you. He knows his time is running out. Young people, there's a battle at your schools for your souls. Not just your minds, your souls. But if you renew your mind and you protect it, with the Bible, and you put on the armor of God, and you go to war every single day, you'll battle, the, not the flesh, you'll battle the spiritual battle, and you'll become more than a conqueror through Christ. Amen. What your brain thinks is where your feet goes. What your brain thinks is where your feet goes. If you fill your brain with the flesh, with the things of this world, uh, you're going to be corrupted, and you're going to go into the darkness. But if you fill your brain, your mind, with the things of God, the light, you will become children of the light. What does the Bible say about the, whole, the children of the light? They belong to God. In the end times is going to separate the wild goats from the lambs. And I want all of us to be separated into the lambs of God. The children of light, not the children of darkness. As we sing this song, I pray the power of the Holy Spirit renews your mind. If you're struggling through something, listen, it's so simple. Read your Bible. God can make you whole. The world doesn't define you. The world doesn't tell you what's wrong with you. The world doesn't know. The only thing that's wrong with all of us is sin. The one who can save us from that is Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. As we sing this song, if you want to pray, use this time to confess. Use this time to say, Lord, I've allowed stupid things in my brain. I've allowed my brain to be corrupted by sin, looking at, doing things that I shouldn't have done, listening to people that I shouldn't have listened to. While we sing the song, let the Holy Spirit bring to your conscience the sins you have to confess and cry out before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I need your help. I need the power of the Holy Spirit to renew my mind, to make my mind fresh. Lord, put a hunger of your word in my life. Young people, we have to devour this every day. We have to be so hungry. This is the only thing we should be studying.
shout, every wall comes crashing down. Jesus for your goodness we thank you for your love we thank you that you're powerful we thank you that you conquered the greatest war the greatest battle the battle against sin and through you we are victorious Lord we thank you Lord God that you sent your son Jesus to die for us and today we can live free hoping uh, that one day we'll be with you in paradise. We thank you for making this possible for us, Lord. We didn't deserve anything. But we thank you, Lord God. All these things you've done for us, we didn't even know you. We didn't even exist yet. But you made uh, all these plans for us, Lord. God. And we thank you tonight. We thank you that from millions of people, Lord God, you've chosen us to hear about you, Lord God, to know about you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for this church. Thank you for tonight, Lord. We worship you. You are worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Um, we had a wonderful time here tonight. Just want to make a few announcements before we dismiss. Um, we're not going to have uh, food and fellowship tonight because uh, we have an early morning tomorrow for, um, I want to make this announcements for all the uh, girls who are coming to Bible study, you probably already know. Um, so Saturday morning, tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., we have the mother and daughter brunch here at church. And this is for the church for the girls who come at the Bible study. So all of you girls who come at the Bible study and your moms, you you already know this. I just want to remind you tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock here at church. They've already prepared the room downstairs so that's why we're not going to uh, hang around tonight we'll uh, do it next friday uh, so tomorrow morning 10 o'clock be here all the girls in the bible study group um, for the mother and daughter brunch 
All right, for Sunday, we have a special uh, day on Sunday. I encourage you to be here, Brother Leonard. Leonard Semenya will be with us both services, morning and afternoon. So uh, uh, the word of the Lord is going to be powerful. And uh, it's going to be a word in English, of course. So I encourage you to be here Sunday for both services. And again, we'll see you again also on Friday. Next Friday, I'll be... Um, Continuing the Bible study, I mean, the, 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 the subject we started a few weeks ago about dating. So uh, we'll, we'll continue uh, to talk about dating next Friday. Uh, be here at 730. And um, once again, we appreciate all of you who came to Winterfest. Did you guys have fun at Winterfest? Was it good? Yeah. Amen, amen. It was awesome. So uh, thank you for everybody who came. Thank you for behaving. And we had a great time. Uh, we'll make a few more announcements a little bit later about the uh, two conventions coming up. There is a, con there is a local uh, youth conference here in Chicago, April 1st. It's going to be at Bethany Church. So it's going to be that weekend of April 1st. It's about a month away, Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night. And there's also the two conventions on the East Coast and West Coast. Uh, the West Coast is at uh, San Antonio, Texas. And I know some of you are going there. I was going to go there. I'm still thinking to see. And then the one on, in Florida, uh, that's the East Coast Convention. So uh, we have these two youth conventions coming up. We'll give you more information um, in the uh, coming weeks. So if you guys want to attend, um, I know some of you, I myself was going to go to San Antonio. Um, but uh, some of you are going to Florida, so uh, we have people going to both of these. So I don't know if we'll go uh, organize. M maybe we'll see each other there. We'll see how it goes. But we'll give you more information um, in the weeks to come. So uh, it was good to see all of you here tonight. Uh, please be careful outside. It's probably uh, snowy outside and it's icy, so be careful when you drive home. And we'll see you again, the girls, tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, the girls from the Bible study. And then we'll see you on Sunday for the church services. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, worship group. God bless you. Amen. Please pick up after yourselves. If you drank water, pick up your water bottle. Let's leave this place clean. Thank you. God bless you all.